tell us a little bit about what this instrument is, uh, Dave, if you would. What's 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 the deal with the hand pan, that wheel that you're playing? Yeah, so it, it does like a, like a wheel or a flying saucer or um, obviously you thought it looked like a, a wheel, Jody. Uh, they're just, it's a piece of steel and it's a uh, singing steel or a sound sculpture invented uh, around the year 2000 in Switzerland uh, by steel pan makers and it was kind of a a cool gift to the world. It's hollow inside. Hey, I was invented in Switzerland too. <laughs> All right. Those are, those are All my good things are. Right? Those are my people. <laughs> so um, I discovered it um, recovering from a brain injury, and it has brought a lot of healing and joy to my life. Oh and, wow! Uh, I'm happy to be on that wheel of um, of healing and uh, that journey. And glad we met, Jody. Excellent. A wheel of healing. I like that. Let's see. Uh, we have our environment here uh, in the studio. We have some featured storytellers that are with us in person. We also have some storytellers that are going to join us uh, via the internets a little bit later. Be in the game. Tonight, of course, the classic game show Wheel of Fortune with Pat Sajak and Vanna White for decades. Uh, Dave, you're my Vanna tonight. <laughs> Uh, this is my interpretation of something Pat Sajak might wear, I guess. Uh, wheel of Fortune, I, I have kind of a little story. It's about a giant wheel, uh, which was not meant to be a Wheel of Fortune, but someone tried to use it as a Wheel of Fortune with, with uh, some mixed results. Uh, a number of years ago, I took my sister and my partner and I were in London, and we got onto the Eye of London, which is a giant observation wheel that takes about 45 minutes to go all the way around, and it has these giant glass pods that are fixed in there, and you can walk around in them, and they serve you champagne. And the idea is it's the highest point in London. It's on the, one, the opposite side of the Thames, so you can look out over the city. Uh, we were excited. We were only in London, I think, for a weekend. So we kind of had to do things at certain times. And we already had our reservation for the Eye of London. And unfortunately, the day was kind of one of those classic London weather days where it's just sort of misty and gray. Uh, it's not really raining. It's more like that nasal drip that just sort of hangs in the air. So the view of the city wasn't super. We couldn't really see like St. Paul's Cathedral. I mean, we could see the Tower of London and we could see Big Ben because those are close enough to the Thames. But anything that was a little further away was kind of hard to see, which was a little disappointing. Um, so we were kind of walking in our glass bubble, looking out over the city with our glasses of champagne that they had handed out to us and looking at sort of just a lot of gray. Until and there were about 20 people in our pod until somebody said, oh, my God, he's proposing. And we we're like, what? What's happening? What? And we looked at the pod behind us and sh and that pod only had three people. It had this man and presumably his girlfriend and then the one hostess attendant who was standing with a tray and some champagne. And he went down on one knee. And all of us were ignoring London completely. Like, this was a way more interesting, dramatic view than the city was providing that day. And so we all just turned and just looked at this glass bubble that was revolving in the sky, where this man had clearly spent some money to reserve it in order to secure his fortune for the future. But we're, it, it took a while. And then one of the people in, in our bubble suddenly just kind of went, <gasps> He's, she said no. <laughs> and sure enough, we are looking in this silent bubble. We can't hear anything. But she has now folded her arms around her and has turned away from him and is actually facing us through the glass wall and kind of just shaking herself <laughs> back and forth. And the poor attendant who has the champagne is just like backing slowly away, <laughs> like incredibly awkwardly. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I am stuck in this bubble with this this couple, who, this guy who clearly counted his eggs way too early. And uh, he then uh, motions her over, and she kind of tentatively walks over, and he just takes the bottle of champagne from her, doesn't even pour it in a glass, and just 
<laughs> turns it up and just starts glug, 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 glug. <laughs> And we were riveted. Uh, I, I don't know how long this took. I mean, we had started a uh, quarter of the way up, maybe. When the proposal happened, we were really near the top. So he had kind of timed it out, like so that the apex of the event would be his grand proposal. But uh, having failed, he now had another 20 minutes or so to just sit in this pod with this woman who has rejected him and an extremely uncomfortable employee with at least 20 audience members in the pod before. I don't know if the pod after was keyed into this or not. Uh, it was not a wheel of fortune for that gentleman that night, not at all. And I'm just enough of a sadist that I made my little party, even though we were the pod in front and we got out first, I was like, can we please just wait here and watch them exit? And, and we did, we did. But actually, once they got out of their pod, they looked much more relieved <laughs> to be out of that enclosed space. And I do hope that their fortunes uh, improved after that. Uh, who knows what happened, um, but uh, it's permanently in my memory as an example of a wheel of misfortune, I suppose. And those are the kind of stories we're going to hear tonight about wheels in, in metaphoric ways. That was a wheel in a very literal way. We have a couple other very literal wheels coming up tonight, too. But they all involve some fortune or chance or something like that. And... Uh, a few of you have an opportunity for some fortune. We are going to move to our first featured storyteller. And the way we've decided is these puzzles are going to serve as an introduction to the story. So if you solve the puzzle, it gives you a clue into the featured storyteller's story. So here we go. Right now, we're going to ask you all to buy a vowel. Type in a vowel. Matt, has our game master, has chosen a vowel in his head. If you match his vowel, you have a chance to become a contestant on the Wheel of Fortune. So here come those vowels. Matt's going to start selecting some players. And we'll see you pop up on the screen here. And then... Uh, Hopefully, we will have a chance to solve the puzzle. Uh, I'm also going to ask Matt what the players are going to play for. He might be busy selecting selecting players at the moment, but in a, a moment, uh, I'll ask Matt what our players are playing for. All right, we're we're pinning our players right now. We're we're selecting from all those vowels that were just purchased. Players. For round one, you will be playing for a pound of freshly roasted Gorongosa coffee. Hey, where's my camera? Look at this. I'm modeling. <laughs> there we go. Good. Keep going. Every Matt. cup has a story. Theirs is from Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique. 100% of profits go to Gorongosa National Park. There we go. I, I was doing your job, Dave. You were supposed to be Vanna. I didn't have the coffee. Sorry. Well, I could give you the coffee. All right. So we have. Do we have some players coming up here? We selected our players for our puzzle, and our first puzzle, I believe, is going to be a phrase. Is that right, Matt? That is correct. Okay. I see three players in our boxes. Hello, players. Let's see. I've got. Uh, do you have your sound on, folks? Yes. Okay, there's a yes. Yeah. All right. Let's start with the couple. I can't see your names in your boxes, but we've it's got a Anna Ruth in the couple there. Anna John, John and Anna. John and Anna. I was going to wonder if it was Anna and Ruth. Um, I mean, my name is Jody, so no judgment. Uh John and Anna, you are with us in Boise? Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. Welcome. The city of roses meets potatoes. All right. And what brings you to the show tonight? Um, my sister, Emma, is going to read a story or tell a story, not read a story. She will most definitely not be reading a story. <laughs> Congrats. Well, good. We got some family from out of town. It's one of the advantages of being online is we can share the stories uh, with family that are far flung. All right. And who else do we have here? Uh, I see a person with a little scarf around their neck or maybe it's a mask. Yes, you. Scarf. A scarf. And I what is your name? I, I think um, I'm DJ. DJ, welcome. And are you in Boise? No, I'm in upstate New York. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. We're all over the place tonight. And what brings you to Story Story this evening? My dear friend, Jodine, who's supposed to be sharing yes. story tonight. Excellent. Oh, we have a lot of support for our storytellers tonight. That's wonderful. All right, DJ, thank you for being with us. And our final contestant there looking with her headphones, looking very in her microphone, looking ready to ready to launch something into space, maybe. What is That's your name? What I'm up to. Uh, my name is Maddie. Maddie, where are you? I'm in Medford, Massachusetts. Medford, Massachusetts. Welcome. And who are you here to see tonight? I'm here to support Emma. Wonderful. <laughs> wow. Emma, you've got quite a fan club here. Excellent. All right. Are you all ready to play the toss up round? As soon as you know the puzzle, just hit that raise hand button. The first one that we see, we're going to pause the puzzle and we'll ask you to solve it. If you get it right, you win the pound of coffee and we'll ship it to you because none of you are local <laughs> and you can enjoy that. It'll be nice and fresh. You'll get to choose which roast you'd like. And if you get it wrong, I'm sorry, you're out. And then the other two will still get to try and solve it. So again, it is a phrase and this will lead us into David Lee's story. Uh, so here we go, right? Oh, a thousand dollars. Ignore that. <laughs> here we go. And here we go. A brand of reaction or a raise hand to chime in if you think you know what it is. We got somebody. Chime in? We got the, the reaction. Who's got the reaction? I'm trying to raise my hand, but I don't know if it's working. I think our hand. Would is you up. like fries with that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Am I so delayed? Warm that round, Matt. Uh, are you going to make a determination on who is getting the fries with their order? <laughs> We're consulting with our judges. One oh, moment, right. please. There's a lot at stake here. 1,000 coffee beans. <laughs> and the winner is... Okay. According to the judges, the couple had a hand up first. Couple, would you like to solve? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb here. Uh, <laughs> would you like fries with that? <laughs> I believe they said, would you like fries with that? That's correct. <laughs> All right, congratulations. Right. We will put you in touch with Aragor and Goza, the coffee with the story, and they Thank will you. be shipped out to you. And now, remember that phrase, would you like fries with that, as we bring up our first, our first featured storyteller who has been uh, part of Story Story Night for a while now. He started as a slammer. Then his slam was selected to become a mini musical. Then he was in Slammer of the Year, and he was back as a featured storyteller, and now he's back again as a featured storyteller. Please welcome back Dave Lee. Uh, let the Wheel of Fortune spin. Round and round and round she goes. Where she stops, nobody knows. Of course, spinning the wheel, that's the easy part. It doesn't take any skill or require any decision making. The hard part's when it stops. What do you do then? Do I guess a letter? Which letter? Do I want to buy a vowel? Maybe I have enough information to solve, solve the puzzle right now. Should I give it a shot? Decisions, decisions. You know, when I come to those big decision points in life, I like to look to the wisdom of the elders. You know, the philosophers, the shaman, the Zen masters, the yogis. There's one particular yogi I rely on a lot. He's very wise. That would be Yogi Berra. Y'all know Yogi Berra. It ain't over till it's over. 
it's like deja vu all over again. But my favorite Yogi Berraism is this one. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. And there's another one that goes, goes along with that. You got to be careful when you don't know where you're going, because otherwise you might not get there. Well, I came to a big fork in the road back in 1981. And at the time, I truly didn't know where I was going. But I must have been fairly careful because somehow I got here. You see, 1981 was when I finished college. Uh, I grew up in Illinois in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, and I went to college downstate at University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. And I finished in 1981 with a degree in elementary education. I'm still asking myself why, but part of the reason is somebody convinced me I wasn't likely to get a job with an anthropology degree, which would have been my first choice. Unfortunately, by the time I finished, I had pretty much decided I didn't want a job as a teacher. So once you've eliminated that, the market value of an anthropology degree versus a teaching degree they're not that different. So there I was, college educated, unemployed, no particular marketable skills, no particular place to go, no particular sense of direction, job-wise anyway. I did have a sense of direction in another, another respect. For a long time, I wanted to move out west. I wanted to trade the cornfields and flatlands of Illinois for the mountains and the forest of the west. I didn't know where, didn't know when, didn't know what I was going to do when I got there, but that's what I wanted to do. Well, as it happened, an opportunity presented right about that time. My brother Terry, he's older than me, he had settled in Denver a few years earlier. And right around that time, he was going through a divorce. He could use a roommate and I could use a place to go. So we talked about the possibility of me moving out there. In the meantime, I needed a few bucks to get together for whatever my next move was going to be. So I went to a temp agency and they placed me at a job at a big corporation. And by big corporation, I mean nothing less than the world headquarters for McDonald's, then located in Oak Brook, Illinois. I was actually there for several weeks. And as I mentioned, at this time, my career path was a complete blank slate. So I was open to any possibilities. So while I was there, I was keeping an eye on their job vacancy board. Something came up that looked like I might have a shot at. Uh, it was, it wasn't a great job, it was entry level. It was in their computer department, or as they called it then, Info Services. Now 1981 would have been a good time to learn about computers, although not everybody knew that then. Uh, but anyway, it looked like it had some potential. Problem being is if I took this job, then I wouldn't be moving to Denver. Hence, the fork in the road. Well, I thought, what the heck? I'll spin the wheel, see what happens. I applied for the job. If they want to interview me, fine. If they want to hire me, we'll see. If they don't want to hire me, that's even easier. I don't have to decide. I'll just go back to my Denver plan. No such luck. They offered me the job. I had to make a decision and I had to make it pretty quick. So I decided to take the job, which meant I had to call my brother Terry and tell him I wasn't going to move to Denver. I'll never forget that conversation. He laughed at me. He called me a chicken shit and he said something about, oh, you're going to be stuck back in Chicago forever. Oh, well, anyhow, I started the job anyway, and it wasn't a great job. In fact, it was actually kind of boring. One of the problems was it was a graveyard shift job. You see, McDonald's had just implemented this new system where, you know, pretty space age for the day, but they had just connected all the time clocks from all the restaurants around the country to the central network that would feed all the information back to corporate headquarters so they can process payroll. Pretty fancy for the time. They were pretty proud of it. And what they needed is they hired me and a couple other people to just 
cover the graveyard shift to man the phones in case any problems arose. And they were going to teach me how to deal with the problems, but they hadn't done that yet. Well, starting out, there wasn't much to do. There weren't many phone calls. So instead, what it was was me and a handful of other people hanging around this big, kind of fancy, but at that time of night, very empty, very lonely office. Gave me a lot of time to think. Among other things, I started thinking about, why am I doing this? Well, they had a lot of, I had a lot of answers to that. Well, like I said before, it's going to teach me some good job skills. McDonald's, that's a good, solid company. I could have a future there. And not only that, I'm close to home, so I have all the safety net protections of all that. I'm doing this because it makes good sense. In fact, if you go back to that fork in the road, if there was a signpost on the road, the one leading this way, it probably would have said something like, making good sense road. By contrast, the other road, the one that would lead to Denver, that might be called something like, do what you want way. Well, fortunately, somewhere early on in the first couple days uh, in those lonely nights in this big office building, I had a realization. I would kind of figured up to that point in my life, I always did the practical thing, the making sense thing, the thing I should be doing. But I figured I'm young, I'm unencumbered, I'm just starting out. If there's ever a time I should be doing what I want to do, this is it. And you know what, if it wasn't for that kick in the butt from my brother, I'm not sure I ever would have come to that real realization. So I changed course. I talked to the people in charge, made a grace, graceful exit from McDonald's, and soon after that I was moving to Denver, and the adventure begins. I didn't stay in Denver all that long, but I um, lived, in, lived in the West ever since then and enjoyed the adventures of the West since then. I still go back to Chicago. I still have family there. And when I do, every time I go back, I have a particular moment of Zen. You see, I always end up going by the building where this McDonald's office was, and I always think about that point in time and how any number of things could have tipped the scales the other way. And it makes me happy because I'm glad I chose the path I did. I'm glad it went the way it did. That was particularly true one year when I was having a particularly difficult time on a visit back home. I think it was in 2014. I was kind of stressed out. There was some family stress going on. It was just one of those times where I was thinking, God, I'm sure glad I'm going to be back home in Idaho soon. And I thought a little further. You know, I'm glad I have a home in Idaho. I'm glad I've had an opportunity to make my home in Idaho. And I'm glad I've had all these Western adventures that I've had. In short, I'm glad I chose the right path at that fork in the road. And something occurred to me. I got to do something. And I called my brother, Terry. He's still in Denver. In fact, actually, he's watching from Denver right now. But anyhow, I called him up and I said, hey, I don't know if you remember this or not, but about 33 years ago, you called me a chicken shit. I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank you, Dave. And I think, if I remember from one of your other stories, you spent a lot of your time as a lawyer, right? That was a career that you had? Well, coincidentally, our show tonight is sponsored by a law firm. And here's a little message from them. Bailey Glasser, a nationwide law firm born in West Virginia, taking on your toughest cases with a newly opened office in Boise, Clients rely on us to handle the most challenging and consequential legal issues regionally and nationwide. More online at baileyglasser.com. And you can see the spelling right behind me, baileyglasser.com. Thank you for being a new sponsor for Story Story Night tonight. And now we are going to talk about a different wheel. Uh, this one is a physical wheel. And I think we actually have a couple of images 
Uh, we're going to bring Bev Bryant in from uh, our Zoom world. And here is a postcard that she posted recently. Greetings from Idaho, an Idaho irrigation wheel. And some of you may recognize you. this wheel. It doesn't look like this anymore. And that's part of what her story is about. This what is what the say? wheel looked like before. And oh, sure. many of Thank you can see it when you're walking along the green belt over by the Warm Springs area. And one of these individuals is our guest storyteller right now. Do we have uh, Bev Bryant? Have we got her screen here? I think I see Bev there. Hello. Hi, Bev. Welcome. Thank you. Great. Well, we're going to turn it over to you and tell us about what, how, this, how this wheel of fortune, this irrigation wheel, it was a part of your life. Oh, man. Back in 1965, my family moved into this house on Warm Springs, way at the end of Warm Springs. And kind of give you a little bit of situation here. It's um, right across the street from the prison and right in the edge of the foothills on the other end of the house where the wheel was is a big old huge cow pasture and then on the other side of the wheel is this really cool jungle so it was a great place to grow up as a child it's the best i felt very fortunate so when we moved in in 65 the wheel was all broken like you saw in that first picture just kind of in pieces around there i don't know that it had ever been restored since it was built i imagine in the early 1900s and so three years after we moved in, my dad decided, and my brothers decided they're going to rebuild the wheel. And my dad has a background in, in construction. He used to build houses. And he actually worked at Boise Cascade. He was the auditor for all the lumber yards. So he knew where the best lumber was. So anyway, he, uh, they decided to do that. If, I believe it took them about a year to rebuild it, two, like two falls. And it was a really interesting process to watch. They wouldn't let me work on it. I was too little. I was in like fourth or fifth grade when they were doing that. But it was fun to watch and they did an awesome job and they'd stick a huge long pole through the wheel when they didn't want it to run. And then when they'd started up every year after they rebuilt this absolutely gorgeous, they did not rebuild the flume because we were not gonna irrigate our backyard from it. And apparently the will was made to irrigate before all the houses were there, a farm with fruits and veggies. And so they actually used it as a, a water wheel. And, but when we rebuilt it, we didn't have a need to do that to water our upper yard with that. So we didn't rebuild the flume and didn't put the buckets back on because the buckets were old and in really, really bad shape. So they just left the buckets down there by the wheel for a little bit of ambiance. <laughs> and anyway, it worked great and we didn't want it to run. We'd stick a pole through it so it would stop. And then when the season would start up, we'd pull the pole out and watch it go. And I always did that every year. That was kind of like my little thing to do. And then one night, this is the scary part about the whole story. I had a friend that was spending the night with us, me, and we were sleeping out in the backyard. Our yard was two layers. It was the upper yard by the house and then a lower yard down by the water wheel. And we were just being, you know, typical fourth, fifth graders talking and all of a sudden we hear something down by the water wheel. And we just immediately froze because we didn't know what it was going to be. So we thought we have to check it out. So we walk over to the edge of the property and look down on the water wheel. And sure enough, two glowing eyes are looking right up at us, scared us to death. We scream, we run in the house, we go up and tell mom and dad. It's probably like three in the morning. You know, they were not thrilled with us. They didn't believe our story. They say, go back to bed. So we go back to bed and we're scared all night about this thing down there. So that's what we called it, the thing, because we had no clue what it was. So over the years, the story would build about the thing down by the water wheel. And looking back on it years later, I'm sure it was probably just a cow that got loose from the cow, you know, the pasture out back. But we always thought it was the monster. But now what I prefer to think about it is, is it's a troll protecting the water wheel because it brought us good fortune over all the years of living there. And I lived there through my uh, 
freshman year, and then we moved out across town. So I got to live there eight glorious years watching that wheel work five of those eight. And that's my story. <laughs> and it looks like you're right on time if that's your little timer going off there. I didn't want to run long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well, you so thanks. much, Bev. And I am sure that troll is still protecting the wheel there. Uh, so the, uh, <laughs> the cows better watch out if they have any bad ideas. But Chris, probably aren't cows there anymore, I suppose, are there? No, and we, not anymore. Oh, it's a golf course. Now it's a golf course. There's some cows playing golf. Uh, here we have the wheel under construction uh, by Bev's father and moving along there, getting further progressed. Yeah, and that's my dad and two brothers. All right. And there is the wheel finished. Yep. The beautiful and wheel. With the pole in it or out of it. We can't tell if it's running or not. How fascinating. And isn't it wonderful that people can walk by it and see it today? That's pretty cool. I uh, do that. Four years ago with my mom before she passed away. So it was really cool to watch that. Oh, wonderful. Thanks for sharing that story with us tonight. We found Bev actually on a History of Boise Facebook page where people started going on about the water wheel and we're like, water wheel? Hey, that's a wheel of fortune. Let's do it. Great. Thank you so much. Thank and you. And now we are off to another toss-up round to introduce our second featured storyteller. So get ready to buy a vowel, and we will select some contestants for this next toss-up puzzle. Uh, go ahead and start buying your vowel now. Matt has a vowel in mind that he is choosing from. I see uh, some vowels coming in now. We had some we had some late entrance. So for this for the for the toss up, just plug in a vowel A E I or U. We already used E, so don't use E. If you want to play our next round, we got a fabulous prize for you. Let's see those in the in the chat there. And our our crack team will be pulling people with the correct answers. And please turn on your camera and your microphone so that you're ready to go to play the toss up round. All right, I think we're about ready to cut that off. So type in your vowel now. Keep going, folks. Oh, okay. All right, are we selecting our contestants? And what we, we might pull in the, some of our people from last round too, that was an idea. They're working on it with our control room. And then we also will reveal the prize for this one. This might be interesting if our players are from out of town because <laughs> I think this next prize is pretty local. Matt, can you tell us about that prize? That's correct, Jody. Our second prize for the evening for this toss-up round is a uh, fabulous one-week night stay at the Idaho City Hotel, <laughs> located only 40 miles outside of Boise. That's Boise, Idaho for you uh, out-of-towners. You can enjoy this perfect getaway at this cozy boutique hotel in beautiful, historic Idaho City. Great. 40 miles for those of you in Boise and 3,040 miles for those of you on the East Coast. So, sort of a trek for the upstate New Yorkers in the crowd, but <laughs> uh, we'll bit. see what we can do. Yeah, a little bit. All right. I, we are getting our players sorted here, and they'll be popping up on the screen. This time, I believe the puzzle is a different. It's a category I actually didn't realize that happened on Wheel of Fortune. It's called What Are You Doing? All right, and I see our three players. Hey, I even recognize uh, one of them, and I recognize the room, I think, of the other one, but I don't see a person. Uh, welcome to, we have Marnie there. Uh, hi, Marnie. I heard a click, but do you have a voice? Hello. There you are. All right. And you have a helper there with you. No. This is James. James, and I know that you are in Boise. Uh, yeah. And what do you do in, in this city of trees? That's you. Me or James? Pick one. <laughs> well, gosh, I, I work for a, a nonprofit arts organization called Searle's Place. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Yeah, it's, it's in Garden City. It's a lovely, lovely establishment. James works for, uh, well, you described. I'm a, I'm a mechanic. A mechanic. All right. Sure. He, he fixes irrigation wheels. It's a, <laughs> yes. not, a, not, not as busy as he used to be, maybe. But anyway. All right. And I think I saw someone from the Seipel family. Oh, maybe. Who do we have here? The couple. Uh, there's a. Oh, maybe I didn't know where I was. A large hat. Hello. Hi. 
Hi, who do who are we have with us tonight? Uh, I'm Natalia. This is Thane. Thane. We have Anthony off camera. I'm Anthony. Oh, he's on camera now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and are you all in Boise? Yes, we are. Yep. Great. And what brings you to Story Story Night tonight? I just love hearing a good story. Excellent. Well, you came to the right place. And then our final player, flying solo, looks like. Hi. Hi, Jody. How are you? Tell us your name. My name's Beth Norton. Beth Norton, who some of you will know, has been on our Story Story Night stage before. And uh, Beth is a stand-up comedian. And also, was there anything else you want to say about yourself before we launch our puzzle? I'm not by myself. I have my cats. <laughs> What's your cat's name? That one's Scratchy. Scratchy. Okay. All right. We're ready to play. So uh, that, that was a little tricky for us last time, the raise your hand thing, but that's what we're doing, right? It, it is. We're, we're, we're already got the kicks for sure. The emoji, the little reaction is shows up a little better. So if you want to use that one rather than the raise hand, I think that's going to work a little better. Okay. We're going to go for the emoji of power to solve the puzzle tonight. Remember again, it, the category is what are you doing? And here we go. Good luck. Oh, Dave, you might have to give us some music. Apparently, we've got no music for this one. Going from life, going from life, to life. <laughs> Someone's working it out out loud. Oh, we have a, we have an emoji there. I think that's I think that's Beth. I saw first. No, never mind. <laughs> never oh. mind. Okay, but we do have another one. Uh, the the group of three with the dog there. <laughs> okay. No, wait, hold on. What was that one more time? No, never mind. All right, never mind. We're, we're going, <laughs> moving forward. Continue. Good. Chime in when you think you have it. I don't see any yet. Who is that? That's not even a player talking, is it? I think I got it. <laughs> you you would appear to be not the only one. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, okay. Is that Beth that's going to give us the answer? Is that me? Am I the one? Yeah, that, yep, it's you. What's, what is your guess? Going from Boise to Bogus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is correct. Going you, from, audience there member. it is. All right. <laughs> All right. We'll have to remind our audience to uh, mute their mics as they're solving the puzzle themselves, yes, I guess, you, in the future. If you don't mind. Who was great. it? They could come with me to Idaho City for a weeknight. All right. That sounds like an interesting rendezvous. <laughs> uh, that's Beth Norton. You can find her on all the socials and you'll get to go with her to Idaho City. All right. And here to tell us about not going to Idaho City, but going to Bogus is our next featured storyteller. It's her first time on the Story Story Night stage. Please welcome Emma Ruth. It was August 2020 when I really started to become restless and the wheels in my head were turning with ideas of what to do with my time. COVID-19 was in full swing and the stay at home order in Idaho or whatever semblance of that we had here uh, was keeping me at home from a job that usually had me traveling to Southeast Asia once a month. Um, I work for a medical device manufacturer. And so now my schedule was completely out of whack. At first it was great. I had always hoped for an opportunity like this. I had lived in Boise for about five years, but really never felt like I had a chance to explore and experience being in my home for an extended period of time. But be careful what you wish for because then COVID happened and I surely had all of that. As with many who were experiencing their first global pandemic, I was swept up in that quarantine living. I had created, nurtured, maintained, and then eventually in a fit of rage, destroyed a sourdough starter. <laughs> I had binge watched all of Ozark. I had every day carefully checked in on my toilet paper supply. 
And I experienced and lived through Idaho's big earthquake of the summer, which was not much to write home about. But I think my neighbors finally were happy to have something to talk about other than the pandemic because I was walking my dog the next morning and somebody from their yard shouted out, good morning, did you have a good earthquake? <laughs> so now I was home and trying to find a way to really take advantage of being here in Boise and wanted to find a way to make the most of this time. So one thing that I really enjoy is running. And especially when I travel for work, I find that, especially for somebody with a pretty poor sense of direction, I find it's a good way to orient myself to a place. So whether it's running from my hotel door to the city center, exploring different tourist destinations, running on the beach, wherever I am, I find that I just really like to use my feet to get that sense of perspective. So I wanted to take that idea here to Boise during this pandemic. Now the pandemic was really, it has been really devastating for a lot of reasons, but I think it's fair to say that there are some silver linings. And for me, this was one of them. So enter my big plan. I love Boise's trails. I truly think they uh, are a testament to what makes this such a livable place. So I decided that I wanted to challenge myself to run from my home in the Sunset neighborhood in Boise to the Bogus, Base, Bo Bogus Basin ski area. And there is a road, but um, that would be too efficient. And so I wanted to try to use the trails as much as possible to get me from point A to point B. Now, I don't, I, I run a decent amount, but I don't have a lot of fancy gear or knowledge or experience when it comes to this kind of thing. Luckily, my fiance Max is a little bit more well versed and he helps some, suggest some things that I might bring with me, such as water, food, and hydration, a hydration uh, filtration system, a water filtration system. Okay, I thought. So we rummaged through our garage and found some of those things. And I figured I was set. My plan was to sort of leave my house and take some trails and wind up at Bogus. How hard could it really be? So the morning of my grand adventure, I was kind of stalling. Was I crazy? Was I going to make it there in one piece? Was this a little bit too ambitious? Yes is the answer, but I didn't know it at the time. So I left at around 7.30 in the morning, feeling pretty confident in myself. I left my home and went to the closest trail system, or part of the trails, which is the Harrison Hollow Reserve, made my way across multiple trails and roads and finally ended up at Peggy's Trail. And Peggy's trail, I was soaring down the smooth terrain. I was feeling really great. Trail running is the best. This was such a good idea. Until I realized that what goes down must also go up. And that sense of soaring down the trail ended fairly quickly when the climbing really started. And I was not even 10 miles in and had like 4,000 feet of climbing left to do. And I had gone from my highest high to a, a pretty low low. So I reached the junction of Peggy's Trail and Sweet Connie Trail, which it's called Sweet Connie. I don't think it's very sweet. It is completely uphill. And I reached that junction and was feeling really uh, <laughs> unsure that this was a good idea. I sat on a rock and had a sort of mini crisis and I had to make a decision. Do I stay in the game or do I keep going? I did have a, a bailout point that I had planned with Max ahead of time where I could call him and he would come pick me up. But I reminded myself that I was doing this for a reason. I was doing this in order to enjoy being in Boise, to explore on my own feet. And I kept reminding myself of a mantra that I set for myself ahead of time, which was, you chose to do this. Nobody's forcing you to, to do this run. So I sat on that rock for a long time. I ate a snack. I thought about life for a while. And then I decided to keep going. So I put one foot in front of the other and kept going up. At this point, a runner wearing really minimal gear, going really fast, soared past me and it was really hot at this point it was 
August. Uh, Boise is called the city of trees, but the trees are truly concentrated in the city. The foothills are very exposed. And so this runner zoomed past me and I think he muttered something about how hot it was and how he should have started early. And I muttered something back about, you know, how dare you make this look so easy. <laughs> so I was moving, but I had a bigger problem now. And my bigger problem was that I was severely low on water and had not passed a single drop of water in the entire time. Uh, it's again, August in Boise, it's dry as anything. So I was on high alert. All of my senses were waiting and listening and looking out for water. And Sweet Connie Trail keeps going up and wraps around the mountain and then there's this drop off down below. And luckily it was getting a bit more lush as I looked down um, and that was a good sign. And finally, finally, as I was completely out of water at this point, continued to check my phone, didn't have any service. So that bailout plan was a complete moot point anyway. So I finally heard not the rushing stream that I had hoped for, it was more like a dainty trickle, but I was not gonna pass up this opportunity, the first water I had seen. So I climbed down the edge of the cliff. It was really muddy. There was a swarm of bees down below. But sure enough, I saw this, the world's smallest little water trickle. And I thought, all right, this is it. This is my opportunity. I will not make it if I don't filter water right now. So another thing I hadn't planned was how to get the water from the water source to my hydration pack that I was carrying. And so I thought of this idea. I had a little water bottle cap and I took capful by capful out of the little water trickle and filled my entire two liter hydration pack. It took a very long time using that small water bottle. So then I climbed back the, on the edge of the trail, got back up there, didn't scrape my knee, didn't get stung by a bee, didn't spill any of my precious water and needed to sit there and filter it. And I won't bore you with the details, but I also had not read the instructions for filtering water ahead of time. And it's a very complicated process that um, it's not instant gratification. Uh, it takes a while for that water to purify itself. And so I didn't have water right away, but luckily eventually I did. So I kept moving after a very long delay. I kept moving and the junction of the Sweet Connie Trail and the East Side Trail, which would eventually bring me up to Bogus, was like a beacon. I felt like I was crossing a finish line when I got there, but I wasn't and I couldn't get ahead of myself. East Side at the beginning, it is fun. Fun meaning it's not completely uphill like I had been going. So I was, I was going down east side and then the climbing started again, but my mind and my body were numb at that point. And so it didn't matter. I didn't know where I was going or, or what I was doing. I was just moving in some direction. So finally, I let myself pull out my map and I saw that I had four miles to go until Bogus, which was the point in which I was to call Max and tell him to leave home to come pick me up. And I called him and he said, all right, I'll, I'll leave to come get you. What do you want to eat? And that was like music to my ears. He knew exactly what I, ne I needed to hear at the moment. And that got me through the idea that I was gonna have Lulu's pizza, uh, got me through the rest of my run. So I climbed up the rest of the East Side Trail and finally I saw the backside of Bogus. In the summer, you can see the lifts and there was some construction going on. And it was a really, really good feeling to see that. And I kept running and, or walking, actually I'm hiking at this point, but in trail running, something that I love about it is that you can hike and it still counts as running. So I like that part of it. So I was hiking up, finally reached the Bogus Basin Road and there's a fraction of a mile from the end of the trailhead to Bogus itself, to the lodge. And so I just took off. I was so excited. I, I started running as if I had been running the whole time. And I passed a biker who was coming the opposite direction. And I think I, I felt a lot better than I looked at that point because he took one look at me and said, did you just run all the way from town? And I had tears in my eyes and I said, yes, I did. But I think he had biked past me at that point. I don't think he actually cared to listen. 
Um, but I had done it and I felt like I had accomplished this uh, task of finding a way to get this new vantage point of Boise from the top of Bogus. I had solved this puzzle of what to do with all of this time that I had during the pandemic. And I had the opportunity to explore my own backyard and a little bit beyond that. Thank you, Emma Ruth. Wow, how productive you've been. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm pretty sure if I'm deciding whether to do something or not, and it involves the necessity of a water filtration system, my answer is going to be, you know what? No, <laughs> not going to do that. That's okay. Even if it, I might run from, I might try anyway. But if it requires me packing things, I'm, I'm the kind of person who doesn't like to prepare for anything. I just like, I would just shoot out the door and then I would die from heat stroke, which is what, what happened, especially in August, that's for sure. Also, the, um, the earthquake uh, actually happened on the same night as our very first virtual story story night event. And, you know, we were scrambling to switch from a live show to a, a virtual show. And my cat was with me upstairs and the earthquake started and we kind of, my cat and I looked at each other and then she went downstairs and I was like, you're right, that's what I should do. So in addition to water filtration, it's necessary to have a cat to let you know what to do correctly. All right, we are reaching our little break point. Um, and Dave, uh, during, well, you're gonna have a choice. During intermission, uh, we will allow for this random breakout room thing. If you haven't done this before, what happens is you'll get a little message on your screen that says, would you like to join this breakout? And you're randomly paired with some other audience members and it's a time for you to say hi to each other. Talk about your wheels of fortune or misfortune, whatever you wanna do. You know, you also have the choice to not do that. Or if it gets awkward in that room, you can exit the room. It'll bring you back here. And Dave, we have something special happening on our stage here. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going to be going on here on the stage during this? Yeah, Jody, we have um, we have Matt, Matthew Nelson and Callie Rose Ritter who will be dancing as I play. And so we'll be telling story, the Wheel of Fortune story, a version of it uh, through dance and music. Very good. Wheel of Fortune through dance and music with Matt and Callie and Dave. So that'll be happening here on stage. We'll see you in uh, 10 minutes back here all together again. All right. And let's welcome Matt and Callie. <laughs>
Wow, okay, I see some uh, messages here for Matt and Callie. Thank you, wow, and Dave. Yes, yes, yes. Welcome back to the second act. Thank you for that Wheel of Fortune piece. Uh, I believe we are moving on to some storytellers. So we're, uh, thank you very much for, for being here tonight with, and expressing a story in dance. I mean, usually we're personal narrative told in the first person. Uh, tonight, we added some visual storytelling as well. Welcome back. Uh, we do want to ha leave an opportunity for anybody out there in our audience who might have a story that you'd like to share for the Wheel of Fortune. We call these story slammers. It's a five-minute story inspired by our theme, Wheel of Fortune, and as you've already seen, uh, it uh, can take a variety of uh, forms of how you connect to the theme. Uh, to volunteer to share a short story, all you have to do is give us a little emoji sign or type something in the text to the effect of, I have a story I'd like to share, or something like that. Do we have any takers out there who would like to share tonight? Creating a pause. Now in our show in person, oh, I see a couple people discussing with each other, like, I think you should tell your story. No, you should tell your story. Go for it. In, in our live show, uh, we have a story booth, and people in the audience write their name on a little ticket, and then uh, that gets brought up to the stage, and we draw it randomly out of a hat. Uh, tonight, though, you have the opportunity pretty much of just uh, volunteering to tell a story, say hello, and you get the stage. Oh, someone's actually leaving. They stood up and they have left <laughs> their camera. All right, apparently that, uh, maybe they're just, maybe they're getting read themselves revved up. Oh, they're back. <laughs> she knows I'm talking about her, even though her microphone is a nun. Uh, we do have a toss-up round coming up. Um, well, let's just see what happens, shall we? This is to lead into our, our featured, our third featured storyteller tonight, uh, who actually we're having a little bit of trouble locating at the moment. <laughs> so this hasn't happened before. It's part of our world of the pandemic. It's like, where is the storyteller? <laughs> now, uh, this is why it's nice when I have like Dave and Emma in the room, because I can see them and know that they're going to come up. In this virtual world, it's like, will I have a storyteller or won't I? So we're going to go ahead and plow through and do our toss-up round, and we'll see what happens. Uh, someone alert me, please, if our storyteller is online, so we know that we're not just um, spinning our wheel. All right. I see what you did there. Yeah. So we're going to buy a vowel again. If you joined late, uh, you just type in a vowel. And uh, did Beth and Norton volunteer to slam, someone just asked? Uh, yeah, uh, Beth, Beth says she'll tell a story. Beth will tell a story. All right. Well, let's. Uh, we're going to quickly switch to that then, and we're going to go over to Beth Norton uh, while we look for Jodine, and uh, let's bring up Beth's camera and mic, and um, this should be kind of a treat. You know, it's that what we say story, story night is. It's spontaneous, right? We don't know what's going to happen. Um, and I see Beth on the screen now. She's going to be live from her kitchen. Uh, hopefully there's nothing on the stove. And uh, Beth, welcome. Thanks for filling in for our story tonight as our virtual slammer for Wheel of Fortune. You know how this works, so I'm just going to turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks for inspiring me. I was thinking about trying to prepare for this, and I, I hadn't thought of anything. And then when I heard the other stories, I thought of a story. So... I lived in Vermont. I moved here from Vermont about four years ago. I lived there for five years. Um, and in my fourth year, I finally decided to buy a car. I had been carless for six years and um, 
not for environmental reasons, just because I couldn't afford one. And I finally had gotten a job that allowed me uh, uh, to be able to get a car. And I knew I wanted a Mazda because I had a Mazda as my first car. I had like a little um, four door gray 95 with the seat belts that, you know, automatically went over your shoulder when you open and close the door and uh, little red Hawaiian seat covers and it was stick shift. I always had driven stick shifts and uh, I just knew I wanted a Mazda because I loved them. And so I thought about this decision for a long time. I looked around, um, I got some advice and I had some people to tell, you know, I had some people tell me like, what you need to do is you need to go to the dealership and you need to find a car that like second owner like already has that new chunk of like money, like newness money, like kind of off the value of it, um, but is still in really good shape and maybe partially covered by a warranty. And um, I looked around, looked around, looked around, you know, drug my heels as I do with decisions for a really long time. <laughs> and I, um, I finally, one day I saw on the Mazda dealer web website that they had two Mazdas in stock, two used Mazdas for sale. And so I took the bus out there. Uh, it was about a 35 minute bus ride to the dealership. This is in the middle of winter in Vermont. It's freezing cold and <laughs> snowing. And I get there and I knew exactly which one I wanted to test drive. It was, um, it was black four door Mazda three with a standard transmission. Um, and I took it out on the highway and, um, just like really opened it up, went as fast as I could. I took that car out for a very long test drive by myself. Um, and I think I, I had not felt that feeling of freedom um, since I had gotten my first car. Uh, and I got my first car pretty late. I didn't learn to drive until I was about 18 and I was 19 when I got that first car and it sat in the driveway of my aunt's house for a while because I didn't know how to drive stick shift and she lived in a very hilly place and that was so I remember that was so frustrating um, after just going all the way through high school and never being able to drive and then going through a six-year period where I also couldn't drive and so I got back to the dealership and I knew I wanted this car they wanted twelve thousand dollars for it I talked them down to 10 and um, they were very sweet about it. And they put snow tires right on the loan. They got me the loan right there. They helped me get insurance. We put it all on the loan. I sat there, I was at that car dealership pretty much all day because I was not taking the bus home, no way. Um, and I, uh, I had heard somewhere before uh, that every, the saying that, um, Every woman needs a every woman needs a wife, and at that moment, I just felt like I had found my wife, and so I named her Wifey, and um, that is the story of my I don't know well, it was my fourth car, but like my the biggest the car I've loved the most. <laughs> Thank you, Beth, and Wifey. All right, so. I guess you've had a wife. This is your fourth wife then. Wow, you're really, you're rolling, you're rolling through them. Well, thank you for that story, Beth. So good to see you and looking forward to when we can be in the same room again as well. And good news. We have found Jodine. Her face is radiant and shining on our screen. So before we get to her, though, we're going to do this last toss up round that introduces her story. So go ahead and buy your vowel. What do we have? What vowels do we have left? So no I and no E, those vowels have already been bought, but any other vowel, and I trust you could figure out which one it is, throw <laughs> that down in the chat if you want to play for our third and final prize of the evening. Our judges will be looking at the chat, they'll snatch you out if you have the, if you've purchased the correct vowel. Here they come, and I think we have an image of the prize that's going to come up here too, because it is a print from Pettit Group Realty. There it is. Tell yes, us, it is. Tell us about that, Matt. It's a print by local artist Kristen Hill, this 18 by 15 inch piece is matted and framed and titled Modulation Number Four. This beautiful piece comes to us courtesy of our friends at the Pettit Group Art Collection. Number four, just like Beth's wifey. 
It's a, it's a theme. We're on fours right now. In fact, there's a four in our next story as well. That's exciting. And speaking of Pettit Group, while they're getting our players selected there, we have a message from our sponsor. I think, Dave, it would be appropriate to have some, like, realtor music under this. Realtor music, music. yeah. Because the Pettit Group is a small, thoughtful, this sounds very thoughtful, a small, thoughtful, carefully curated group of Boise realtors who are passionate about serving our clients with integrity and professionalism and our community with deep philanthropic giving. We'd love to have you like our Facebook page, the Pettit Group at Group 1 Sotheby's. You don't have to just spin the wheel. Give us a call and let us help you solve the puzzle of home ownership. Thank you to Pettit Group. All right, and our next category that you are going to compete in to, for this beautiful print by Kristen Hill is called Before and After. That means that the word in the center is the last word of the first phrase and the first word of the second phrase. And do we have our players coming up? I was trying to think of an example of before, after. Uh, Something like... Like uh, hand, pan, handle. Yeah, there you go, exactly. Hand, pan, handle. See, hand, pan, pan, handle. It's like that. Oh, I see our players. All right, in I the I see a person wearing a hat. Nobody else has a hat on. Hello, how are you? Say hi. Yeah, what's your name? Can't hear that, but you look wonderful. One second, we're gonna play charades. While we're doing this, I'd like to remind everybody that's not playing to go ahead and mute or otherwise, you know, this isn't watching Jeopardy where you can shout the answers at the screen. We don't yes. want to give anything away. So, yeah, that uh, Beth got an unfair advantage there, didn't she? I, th right. I think I heard your mic there. What's your name? Heather B. Hi, Jody. It's Heather B. It's Heather B. Hey, Heather, I haven't seen you in ages. Hello. I know. I and, it's kind of dark. It is. Yeah. But we're lightening the mood now with our Wheel of Fortune. Uh, are you in Boise? You are. Yeah, because I know you tra you've done, done some traveling and now you're back in town. Wonderful. Great. Well, and you're an artist as well. So you can appreciate you could appreciate this Kristen Hill hanging on your wall. I have a feeling. All right. And we have some other players. We have uh, let's see. We looks like we have a trio maybe there. Uh, hello there, group. Uh, do you have a representative who's going to speak for you? Um, we'll let Jennifer speak. <laughs> hey, Jody, it's fun. Hi. <laughs> How are you tonight? Good. How are you? Very good. All right. And our last player flying solo there uh, in a glow of beige and brown. Well, maybe, I don't know. Is it beige? I don't know. Our, our bearded, our bearded guru. Uh, say hello to us, would you? Uh, hi, everyone. Nick Warden. And Nick Warden, I will reveal, is one of our board members. So should he solve the puzzle first? I don't believe he is eligible for the prize. So sorry about that. <laughs> that may not be true. We'll check. Let's see how you do. All right, here we go. We're ready to go for the puzzle. Uh, remember, you hit an emoji when you're ready to solve it. Everybody else is quietly muted. And the category again is before and after uh, for, uh, here we go. Tension is building. Uh, okay, I, I see some movement there. Okay, I got. We got Heather emoji. first. Okay. Would you like to try to solve the puzzle? We're going to Heather. Say it again. House of tarot cards. House of Tarot Cards is, Jodine, I can see you giving a thumbs up. That is the correct, that is correct answer. And that leads us right into our final featured storyteller of the night. She also is coming back to us, although it's been about four years since she was a featured storyteller on our stage. It's amazing how fast time can pass. Please welcome uh, live from her studio, Jodine Revere. Hello, Jodine. Oh, and we don't have sound on Jodine. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. You can hear me. Okay, cool. All right. Um, Share your story with us. We're excited to hear it. The House of Tarot, tarot Cards. Okay. Wow, this is 
so weird seeing my face with lips that are not working in conjunction with the things I'm saying. I'm not sure where to look. Um, okay, so bear with me with this. <laughs> um, the universal rule of thumb when dealing with any sort of um, inquiry tool like uh, um, horoscopes or yogi tea bags or tarot cards is that uh, they're not divination tools. Okay, they're not to like try and tell the future or change things at all. Uh, so questions like, uh, when will I die? And who will I marry? And the Reuben or the BLT? These are questions that you probably shouldn't be outsourcing anyway. So a more uh, indirect question to ask is, what do I need to know right now? So that seems to be the better, the better question. What do I need to know right now? So after I separated from my husband pre-divorce, um, I did what legions of women before me have done. I upped my yoga game. I saw a psychic and I started obsessing over tarot cards. What did I need to know right now? And I was already a yoga teacher. So I already had that box checked and that practice had certainly been something that had allowed me to move through the emotional difficulty of going through a divorce. And um, in some ways, I think that the yoga itself maybe kind of catapulted me out of my marriage as I began to see a very different part of myself, um, something that had more focus and more strength and more positivity that prior to having this practice, I don't really feel like I possessed particularly. So I liked feeling like this. And because of that, I taught a whole lot more. And I don't know if you know this, but it's incredibly difficult to go through a divorce. Um, and end a marriage, especially a good one. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. And I found that I was trying to make sure that I was doing the right thing. So I started looking for a lot of validation from, uh, I saw body workers, I saw energy workers, um, and they would tell me, like they could see things, they were intuitive, they could see things, they could feel things, they could feel that I was having a very difficult, very difficult time in this. And so the overwhelming response was, you are in the middle of a huge transition and you are trying to find your own voice and trying to make your own path. Okay, that's true. But pretty much that can be said of any woman over the age of 40. That's not really a stretch to get to that sort of outcome. You are going through a huge transition. You're trying to find your path. You're trying to find your voice. Right, of course we are. So once I passed through the gates and, and became an officially divorced woman, um, my female students started coming up to me after class and they'd had this particular look in their eye and they'd ask if maybe we could have coffee afterwards. And I knew immediately that they were thinking of either leaving a relationship or ending a marriage. And I was right every single time and I'm not even psychic, right? So it became a running joke of mine that, uh, you know, be careful because yoga will F you up you will leave your job, you will leave a relationship, you will uh, move, you will start your own job, start your own business of some kind, and um, you'll start discovering all of these things about yourself because you'll be spending more time in the pro quiet on your mat with yourself, and you'll start starting to learn that maybe there's a bunch of things Things that you need to take care of and that maybe there are things that you need to take care of by yourself and especially if you've never been by yourself before you might have to do these things so not long after this um a friend of mine very dear friend of mine uh, did a lifetime to spread for me and it was huge like huge giant spread so it was you know wealth and health and your relationships and your past and present and future and your creativity and your strengths and your weaknesses and everything was all laid out there and it was quite it was quite overwhelming I resonated a great a great deal with that so I started my own ritual of where I would make coffee in the morning I would uh, light a candle I would burn incense I would do a card reading and then I would write in my journal and that was how I started my mornings it was a really peaceful really lovely way to start to start my time and the only question that I ever asked every time I did this was, what do I need to know right now? What do I need to be aware of right now at this particular point in my life? And I always felt like I was given some answer, some gleaning that made sense to me. 
me. Like you need to be more patient. You need to be open to other perspectives. You need to be um, aware of the fact that you have very black and white judgments around things. Um, you're in a particularly radiant and uh, magnanimous time in your life right now. You should use that to your advantage. So things, so things like that. I found that was super helpful. So a year later, it's my. <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, you're still, you're still with us. I'm lost. No, we have you. Uh, it's your birthday, isn't it? Do you have me? Yep, you're Let here. Me join in. Okay, you're not here for me. Maybe that's an okay thing. That's so it's a my birthday. It's my 46th birthday. Um, I'm joining. I'm launching. Here I am. So it's my 46th birthday <laughs> and I have recently met um, a man, a young man that I'm very intrigued with and he and I've been spending time together, uh, which is great, but he's also getting ready to move to another city, which is makes me sad because um, I'm quite intrigued with him and we seem to have a very dynamic connection together. But I'm also a little bit relieved at the idea of him no longer being in my life all the time means that I'm going to have little more opportunity to uh, not be so distracted by him. So I invite him to my birthday. He and eight of my very dearest friends who all share this love of the spiritual and uh, the magical and the ritual. So I'm 46. You add the four and the six together and you get 10. And 10 is the number of the Wheel of Fortune card in the Tarot deck. Um, it's a very dynamic card and essentially what the gist of the meaning is that you can move your life in more uh, fortunate directions by being objective, by being flexible, by being open to reaching for new opportunities and ways to express your creativity and often this is ignited by some kind of aha moment. Uh, where you realize that uh, it's good for you to take risks and to reach out for new opportunities. So the entire evening has this very rarefied air to it. Um, he and my friends seem to meld seamlessly together. And I kind of wonder if maybe he's a risky opportunity that maybe I'm supposed to pay attention to in my life right now. So he moves. We uh, text a little bit, email a little bit. And then I see the psychic. I swear to God, like my intention in seeing her really didn't have anything to do with him at all, honestly. And uh, I ran into someone that I know who had seen her and said that she was amazing. She was like so insightful and so intuitive. And she would give you this great, you know, um, objective overview. That's the key word, objective overview, overview to my life and where I'm standing right now. So I thought, okay, that sounds, that sounds good. I can do that. And so I set up an appointment with her. We had the initial chit chat, talk about my new singleness, my world, and very casually I say, um, I've met this man and I just wonder if he has any relevance in my world. Super unemotional, super disconnected. And her response to this is, I have never all of the history of the world seen two more people, healers more powerful than you, lovers, soulmates more star-crossed than you. You are so powerful and have amazing work to do. Like your love is destined. You know, cue organ music, right? <laughs> but she actually does have sort of an uncanny insight into us and symbols and, and music and uh, images and things that have relevance for us. And so I fall really hard. I go from being um, having a bruised heart to moving forward and reclaiming my life to being completely committed to making this man see the light of how we are this entwined intergalactic love destiny thing. Right? This is kind of my life's work for a couple of years. Now I have no interest in talking about this truly embarrassing part of my life at all. But what I am interested in is why do we as women seem to so much need validation from outside about our feelings, about our thoughts, and about our motivations? Why was I so willing to believe some woman who was a total 
total stranger to me who did not know me, who did not know this man, because she said things that maybe on some subconscious level I wanted to hear. And I wonder if maybe it is after a lifetime as women of being gaslit from the time we're children, you're okay, you're not hurt, you don't feel that, you don't think that, that's not what you think. I don't know what you're talking about. God, can't you take a joke? I was only kidding. God, you're so sensitive. Don't you have a sense of humor about anything? That never happened. I don't know what you're talking about. I can't believe that you would think X, Y, Z about me. This constant barrage of, you don't know what you feel. You can't be trusted with what you think or what you experience. And every decision that you make is wrong. So we feel like we need to get permission from religion, from authority, from men, from experts, from expert men, from psychics, from tea bags, from cards, from elsewhere, because I couldn't possibly be trusted to make a decision that's right for me. I couldn't possibly be trusted to choose to do something because that's the thing that I choose to do. So during this time, I began to obsessively pull tarot cards, you know, asking more specific questions, disregarding readings that I didn't really like, trying to find more information like through the cryptic message of the thing of like, what, what was it that I needed to know right now? Instead of just looking at the facts and how did I actually feel when I was with this man in this relationship? Not what did I imagine that he was, you know, shyly hiding away in some mysterious inner man cave of his, but he was just too scared to share with me, which by the way, that is not even a thing. Okay. So even though he and I did have this connection, this for lack of a better word, magical connection, there was no relevance or purpose or meaning to why we were attracted to each other. He was not emotionally available. Didn't really matter why. I, that should have been plenty of information for me to have just cut ties and moved on. All the information was there and there was nothing remotely mysterious about it. So my interest in the tarot is way less romantic than it used to be. Although I still love the ritual, I do um, find merit in it. And I just don't put as much weight in the relevant what comes out of that. I'm learning to trust uh, my awareness more, to be willing to look at the actual facts that are laid out in front of me and um, realize that uh, that that is more important than grasping for some sort of message in the ether that I think is the thing that I want to hear. So I will always um, associate the Wheel of Fortune with this particular moment in my life when I was completely, utterly unable to see what was completely in front of me because I so desperately wanted someone or something else to give me a sign. But what I do know is that we can all anytime turn our lives in more fortunate directions by being flexible and objective and reaching for new opportunities and ways in which to exert our creativity. And often this is sparked by an aha moment where we are pushed to take more risks and be willing to uh, reach for new opportunities. And that is a fact. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jodine. Thank you everyone for being with us tonight. Here comes our closing song. And uh, Dave is gonna embellish it a little bit, I think with his wheel of fortune there. Story Story Night receives support from the Boise Arts and History Department and is supported by public funding for the arts through the Idaho Commission on the Arts, the Idaho Legislature, and the National Endowment for the Arts. 
Thank you to our media sponsor, Radio Boise, where we also have a monthly radio program on the Sunday night before our live show on Stray Theater at 5.30 p.m. Thank you to our show sponsors, Bailey Glasser and Pettit Realty Group, and to our story subscribers. Several of you, I see you up on the screen tonight. If you would like to join this group of supporters, which includes tickets and other perks, you can text right now on your phone, story, story, to 44321 and become a story subscriber. Thank you to our crew, technical director, sound and podcast engineer, Stephen Baldessari. Thank you to our photographer, Chelsea Hirata, our game master, Matthew Melton Kelly, and our guest musician, Dave Jones, with his dancers, Callie and Matt. Thank you to our volunteers and board of directors. Thank you to Valiant Productions and the entire team for hosting us. Now, our next classic TV game show is Love Connection, and it'll be going to be a bit different. This is the show that attempted to connect singles with a compatible partner, but in our take, we're partnering with photographer and storyteller Angie Smith, who and her project 19 Love Stories, which she created. Uh, she'll be with us here on Saturday, uh, sorry, on February 23rd, our single sharing the love connections she's made in this project through stories and interviews. And story, story night, story, story, good night. Beginning, middle, now, at the end. <laughs> Authentic. Someone has just typed in there, Jodine Best. And tonight was also spontaneous. <laughs> so thank you. You shared your stories and really listened I might have come here as a stranger but now I'm leaving as a friend and so the story doesn't end Good night, everybody. Thank you for being with us tonight. We'll see you again for Be In The Game Love Connection on February 23rd. I hope all of your wheels bring you great fortune. And people are asking for tarot readings, Jodine, so we can hook you up. <laughs> Beth Norton is going to Idaho City with a mysterious stranger, and maybe they'll ride together in Wifey. We'll see you next month. Be well, be healthy, be fortunate. Good night. Thanks, Jody.